This is Saving the Game, a Christian podcast about tabletop role-playing and collaborative storytelling. Recorded Monday, January 24th of 2019, it's episode 145. In this episode, role-playing mental illnesses, plus handling planned gaming hiatuses, City on a Hill Gaming's actual play, Grant's Eberron game, our YouTube channel, Sea Lions, and more. Welcome to Saving the Game. I'm Grant. I'm Peter. And I'm Jenny. How are we doing, folks? Good. I just got back from the first half of a, a Ray Charles tribute concert. Ooh. So I'm I'm mm. quite pleased with that. Normally, like when you when you say tribute band, what you think is like a bunch of guys who kind of know how to play the instruments, but like somehow our local theater group managed to get like award-winning artists who happen to have a Ray Charles tribute band. Oh, that's awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're all Canadian award-winning, except for the drummer who's from Memphis. Which is close enough to Nashville where he probably got some of that Music City juice on him, so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. We have a, a decent musical tradition in the South. It's Mm-hmm. It's there. <laughs> it's a it's a known worldwide thing, you know. It's, it's, it's the music is not thing. my favorite, but I understand there are people who like it. Mm-hmm. Millions of them, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling great. I had a productive, if rather tense, work day, and then went to the gym, had a delicious, healthy dinner, and am feeling fired up and ready to go. No, oh, I've showered, and I, I just feel I feel good. I feel great right now. Awesome. That's good. My day started off harsh. Cars suck. Yeah, cars do suck. Then I got some good news that may or may not amount to anything, and I really can't share yet, but it was definitely good news. Woo. And then it was really boring for the rest of the day, and I drove home. So... (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into what we're doing this episode. We are talking about mental health and role-playing mental illness in this episode. Now, we're going to be talking about this pretty carefully because we are not mental health professionals. We have talked with them. Yeah, we've talked with them, and we're going to link a lot of our previous episodes that we've done with folks like Jack Birkenstock, the folks from what is now Game to Grow, Sarah Lynn Bowman, all that stuff. We're going to link those in the show notes. Please make sure to take a look at those. You know, we're going to be diving into this in a fair bit of depth, which I'm excited about. But first, I got to tell everybody... I feel like I actually ran a good game session last Saturday. (laughs) You ran a great game session last Saturday. Normally, I'm real harsh on myself and I'm picking out things that went wrong. I had real trouble finding anything to criticize. And that's really rare for me. I had things to criticize about like my own performance, as it were. But like, you ran a great session. Yeah. Good. I I, I mean... I got to the end of the session and I was like, it's going to be a long week till next Saturday. (laughs) It's it's feeling like a long week, too. Also, a really short week because I have like two maps I need to make. But that's a time issue for me. I've been I've had other demands on my time this week. But we, we kicked off this game. We spent about 30 minutes playing Fantasy Home Decorator or Fantasy Office Decorator, as it were, <laughs> which was shockingly fun. And then client came in. Asked for some help, and you guys were off to start investigating a mysterious and weird robbery. So, yeah, it felt good. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I really like about this, one of the many things I really like about this game is this is the first one that we have started from, well, I like it. I've liked a lot of the stuff we've done building up to it, which is kind of what I'm going to get into here. This is the first game that we have started from scratch with our entire current gaming group composition. Mm-hmm. We added... A couple of new people during the Colony game and one after mine started. Should be clear, Jenny was one of the people we added, so. Yes. And so this was the first time where we got all five of us who were playing. The full group group template, as it were. Yeah, to be able to to sit down and, like, create characters that kind of had pre-existing relationships and little personality conflicts and that sort of thing. And I I think it's going to be great. I'm really, in particular, looking forward to playing off of um, Jenny's character, Ganelon, because mm-hmm. I, the two of us are kind of running the business, but she's kind of, if I'm the president, she's the CEO. She's just a little bit above me. And then our newest player, who 
had never gamed before she joined us for that first game uh, with Grant, like against those grungs back in the day, but has taken to gaming, not like a duck to water, but like a fish to water. Yeah. Perhaps even a shark to water. (laughs) Yeah. She's doing great. And I I think the interplay with her character is going to be a lot of fun, too. Oh, yeah. Charlie is a great character. Yeah, she really is. Mm -hmm. Solid, solid character. Yeah. And she has definitely not fallen into a lot of the new player traps Mm -hmm. with Charlie, which is really good. Yeah, she's nuanced and she's got like an actual personality. Brought in a bunch of good NPCs, is connected to the setting in good and complex ways. Yeah, really solid. Yeah, some tropes, but nothing like corny or cheesy. She's just really, man, you you needed to start doing this sooner. You're fantastic yeah. well, at it. <laughs> it. True for a number of reasons. But yeah, and it's not just her. Like, you know, my wife's character, I'm really happy with. Oh, yeah. Your characters are great. We have one guy who's struggling to put a a character together because of some stuff he's going through. And he just kind of wanted to back off and and not put a ton of effort into it, which I totally get. Like, And even his character is great. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, we asked for like a little – one of the things I threw out there because Eberron is a kind of wide magic setting. Magic is present but at a a low level. And I was like, hey, you know, everybody think of like some little magic trinket you've got. It can't have any game effect but just something cool. And I got a little bit here and a little bit there, and all of a sudden, I get a page about this one particular item and this this character's relationship to it and the things he knows and doesn't know about it. To be fair, like, I read this description. I think I was the first one who saw it in our, our group chat. And yeah. I'm I'm reading through this thing. I got a little choked up. Oh, yeah, me too. It's like, yeah. I had, like, this little hitch in my breathing. I was like, oh, the feels. Yeah. <laughs> So the the long and short of it is I ran a good session because I didn't have to put much effort in. You guys were awesome. (laughs) Kind of what it came down to. That's kind of how it's supposed to work, isn't it? It is. It is. Although I feel really happy once we wrap up this little this first mystery, because we're kind of doing semi episodic mysteries, just, you know, for, for those listening at home, because it is a private investigative business, basically. You you guys are PIs working together. I'm going to eventually talk about how I'm structuring those because I feel really good about how I'm laying things out and like sketching out potential paths, like literally sketching on pieces of paper, like nodes and lines connecting them and like flow of how things are going to go, but keeping it kind of loose. So I'm feeling good about it. It it seems like it's going to go in some really interesting directions. Also, it started off with an art theft. And what is better than an art theft? Oh, yeah. A train job. Just saying. A crane job? Train train job. Oh, the train, train job. Train I, job. I was like, Sorry. <laughs> I heard a frame job. Oh, okay. Well, why not all three? <laughs> Pun. There you go. Yeah. Por que no los tres? You know the why, why don't we have both meme? Why don't we have three por que no los tres? I don't know Spanish. Yeah, I, I don't know memes, so... Well, chirp, chirp. <laughs> there we go. We we should leave the awkward <laughs> this, silence in. <laughs> this episode brought to you by the internet's oldest memes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, that's been fun. We're gonna have a lot more to talk about it, but I'm feeling great about that and am super excited for Saturday. Uh, speaking of games that are going well, we don't have this in our intro thing, but we should say that the first session of City on a Hill went pretty well and. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It did. seems like that's going in interesting places, too. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys don't even know the half of it. The Because, yeah. Yes, because you did a secret thing that we'll be finding out. It's not that secret. We talked about it's it. It's a secret thing. It's a secret, secret, secret thing. It's, it's, <laughs> okay, by the time we release this episode, it will not be secret at all. <laughs> but it's secret while we're recording, so... There's there's another recording. There's going to be a sort of a preamble to the first major session that Ryan and I recorded together. Uh, I controlled three characters at once, and it was fun. Oh, boy. Yeah, I did not roleplay three characters at once. I, I should clarify. I controlled three characters in combat and had fun. Very cool. So I'm I'm excited about that. It's going to be fun. Mm-hmm. One last little bit of business before we get into our topic, because I want to get into our topic fairly quickly here. We have a lot to say. For those of you who don't know, 
Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Those of you who listened to our bonus episode re- that we just released on uh, objectives and key results may remember we talked about the YouTube channel a lot. So far, at least, we've gotten a little better about updating that. I'm trying to get some backlog episodes up there. Jenny's created a very nice template for the descriptions and some tagging stuff is coming and, you know, all that good stuff, stuff on the back end. If you like to use YouTube for podcasts, we're going to try and get all of our previous episodes there. That's that's mostly on me, so poke me if you think I'm not going fast enough. Seriously, go ahead and do that. You know, join our Discord and throw things at me through the internet. It works. <laughs> But we are doing that, so those of you who like that sort of thing, there we go. We're making some progress there. Let's go ahead and roll on our big old table of questions here. Oh, no. I've lost my die. Oh, no. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Ah. I I don't actually have dice. Hold on. What what has happened? Who am I? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Here we go. Let's see. Oof, we're down to four people. All right, rolling a tiny die. It's what I've got. Oh, there we go. This is from Raymond Dixon. Oh, hey. Hi, Dad. (laughs) Ray asks, how do you like to deal with a planned hiatus in a game? Summer, scheduled surgery, travel. Not just going ahead with someone missing from the game, but putting the whole thing on hold for a bit. Interesting question. Thank you. It's a good one. It's tricky. It's very tricky. I don't think anybody would say it isn't. First thing for me is make sure that everybody is on board with that hiatus. Mm-hmm. Right? I, if if you can't do that, you're just arbitrarily ending the game or, or pausing it or whatever. It's not a planned, it's not properly planned, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, second, I think the big thing is set a specific date which it will come back on. You can always adjust that later, but have one in mind. Hey, I should be back from travel by this time and we can pick it back up. Hey, you know, my surgery will probably take me this long to recover from. You know, if you have to put it off another week after that or whatever, you can you can adjust, but set a goal. I think that those are the two big things. Other than that, a lot of it is buy-in and trying to do something to keep people thinking about it. Yeah. I know some people who do like email chain kind of stuff, even just talking about the characters. It's also useful if you can, and if you have enough time in advance, to at least try to wrap up an arc, but still leave hooks for the plot later. Because that keeps investment in, but you're also not so in the middle of things that you forget details and and stuff like that when you come back. Yeah. I think I'm going to probably be a little bit of a downer here and say no matter what you do, there's a decent chance that it just torpedoes whatever it is that you're currently in. And you have to be okay with that. Yeah. What, whether or not you're happy about it, it's like, you know, as we've said for six years and counting now, the lives of the people around the table are more important than the thing going on at it. Exactly. Sometimes you just got to accept that that's what happens and go from there. Yeah. And maybe running... A game in that downtime, like if it's a lengthy enough downtime that there's time to game, run a game that has a very specific wrapping up point so that you, the rest of the group has something to do and you guys are, are not flying off in different directions, but you're not going to do something that excludes the person who is involved in the hiatus. Though that only works if there's like one, one or two people gone. It does. It does. That's that's what I was going to say. If it's one person that's that's kind of causing the problem, that works. If it's like four of your five people are going in different directions on summer break, obviously email gaming is a great thing. Some of it honestly is even just keeping touch as people. Forget gaming related stuff. Just tweet at each other or, or send emails regularly or, you know, do a, a weekend hangout or something and you know, just stay in touch. If the social connection is there, you're much more likely to pick that back up later. I think Peter's right. Odds are better than not, especially for a game that is not full of close friends. If it's just, you know, if we're just talking about like a pickup game at a game store or something like that, uh, it's it's going to be real tough, which stinks, but that's the way of the world. There we go. That's That's all we got. Right. Thanks very much for your question. We really appreciate it. And if you want to ask questions on Patreon, send us a question through our Patreon message system or email us at hosts at stgcast.org. 
if you are one of our backers. It, all you have to do is back us for a dollar or more on Patreon. And we're down to just a few people who have questions. We have a big list of questions still, but they are all from just a small number of people. So please do get those in to us if you can. We really appreciate it. Okay. We have a big, complicated topic here. Let's get our scripture done because our scripture is very important and very applicable to this. Maybe, maybe more so than the past few episodes. Uh, you know, where we read scripture, we've had a lot of bonus episodes. So let's do that. And then let's, let's get started on this. Uh, I can take Isaiah. Isaiah chapter one, verse 17. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. And this is Matthew 25, 41 to 43. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And we have James, chapter 5, verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And we have 1 John three seventeen through 18. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So, as we said, we're talking about mental illness and insanity and madness tonight, and we're talking about role-playing those things, not analysis or treatment or anything like that. And that's, we, we have a couple of things we need to talk about before we even get into this, okay? First, we're going to treat mental illness, madness, and insanity as distinct topics. We're sort of in using these somewhat arbitrarily, not completely, but somewhat. In real life, the human mind is a spectrum of all sorts of complicated factors, and there's a lot of overlap and blurriness. And we are not experts in this, okay? So we are being arbitrary in these distinctions. What we're really trying to do is distinguish certain concepts so we can talk about them from a gaming perspective and, you know, from what little advice we know to give. Because mental illness is a real and serious thing that people struggle with and suffer from, and that's something that needs to be treated with respect. This is the realm of things you find in the DSM when we talk about mental illness. Anxiety, depression, PTSD, bipolar, schizophrenia, all of these things, things that you might find on a list of mental disorders or madnesses in an RPG book, even though that's a terrible treatment in almost every case of how those are, those actually are. Just if you can think, if you think of them in terms of specific terms and, and syndromes and illnesses, that's kind of what we're talking about when we say mental illness. Now, we also have insanity which is a blanket term for irrational behavior. Here we're talking about people who are acting in insane ways because of extreme stress or heightened emotional states. The, the insanity being referenced in an insanity defense is what's being discussed here. I was out of my mind, right? Note that this is distinct from wild beliefs in some cases, like cult indoctrination or conspiracy theory mongering, that sort of thing, right? And finally, for certain genres, there's a supernaturally induced madness that's appropriate to talk about, it, given that we are largely talking about games with genre fiction elements, right? Horror and fantasy in particular have a lot of madness inducing creatures and spells and so on. Yeah, it's really hard to do anything with the Cthulhu mythos without some kind of like supernatural madness element in there. Even in harder genres, there are cybernetics and brainwashing and all this sort of stuff that is not supernatural, but ultimately is the here's a genre fiction element that is applying madness to somebody. Yeah, it's kind of an external imposition. You know, it's it's the, the mental illness and insanity are kind of internal for the, the purposes of this discussion. Uh, madness is something that comes from outside and kind of forces you into a bad state. If it involves a Shoggoth, it's madness. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Second note here. We're going to be using the word trigger a fair amount. And this is not some kind of jab at we're triggering the snowflakes or whatever. This is an actual term. And we're using it that way as you should. Because it's a term that mental health professionals use to describe a particular circumstance or set of circumstances that cause certain symptoms of mental illness. We're going to be using it that way. And anyone who doesn't use it that way 
needs to stop, frankly. Uh, Christ calls us to be compassionate, not mocking. Just a quick side note on this. Um, <clears throat> if you if you think of um, it being used in kind of the same way that you would think of like triggering some explosives or something like that, it's it helps. And it's it's a pretty good analogy, too, because it's like something small setting off something big, which is probably why they started using the term in the first place, if I had to take a guess. Yeah. Uh, now, if you're hearing the frustration in my voice, it's there for a reason. Yeah. And yeah. mine. Okay. And Jenny's. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not talking. Well, fair enough. Uh, I... It gets, I, the sigh. Me, it gets I can, me angry, and I we're going to move on now. Yeah, I can hear yeah. it through the slowly deprecated Google Hangouts. All right. <sighs> yeah. Third note, and we're going to say this over and over. We are not mental health professionals. We are not even sort of mental health professionals. <laughs> not even a little. I took a, psycho a child psychology course that one time. That's about as close as it gets. <laughs> yeah, I had a general psych course as part of my criminal justice degree, which I finished up like a decade and change ago. Yeah. AP Psych? That's all I got. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the thing, right? Uh, we've had mental health professionals on the show before, as we said, but we only know enough to know for certain that we are not rated to give medical advice on this show. We are past the Dunner. Was it the, the Dunning Kruger? Dunning Kruger, yeah, Dunning -Kruger effect. effect. We're past that point. We know we don't know enough. And that's it. We can speak anecdotally about behaviors we've seen, read about, or experienced personally. But we cannot speak authoritatively about treatment, especially your treatment or treatment for someone you know. We aren't going to try to do so in this episode, so please don't construe anything we do say here as treatment advice, okay? If you're looking for that advice, there are professionals you need to talk to for that, and please do so. And we are not them. Well, that, but also <laughs> we want to encourage you to speak to those professionals. Now, if you want to hop into our Discord, which you can find at our website, stgcast.org, and you want to ask for prayers and support while you go do seek treatment or encouragement to seek treatment for you or for someone else. We will give you that happily and freely. And the whole community is going to back you on that. All of our listeners. We get a lot of requests for prayer in, the, in our faith channel on our Discord for a good reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because people actually do when it's asked for. Yeah. You know, yeah. take advantage of that. But please see a professional. We are not those. Okay. They can help you in ways that nobody but a professional can. Now, one last little thing here. This is before we start getting into like the mental illness, insanity, madness breakdown here. Here's a, a general concern. All of these things we're talking about are a safety concern at the table, potentially. You don't want to upset someone. You don't want to rub salt in their wounds. So approach role-playing mental illnesses of any sort with caution. Bring it up ahead of time at the table kind of get sign off from the whole table on it and be ready to stop if someone shows discomfort, either yeah. when you talk about your character initially or during play. And this is general good advice, but be extra sensitive to it when we're doing this. Mm -hmm. This should happen at session zero around the same time that you talk about lines and veils. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, actually, this stuff may be a line or a veil for somebody. Uh, it is for me. I can say that right now. There are several topics that we're probably going to bring up that I do not want brought up in a game. I can talk about them now. I cannot talk about them on a regular basis or it will be too it will be too spoon heavy. We will talk about spoon theory soon, but the more certain subjects like this get brought up, the weightier it feels. And that's not what I game for. So everybody 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 has to be on board if you're going to do this. And I'll tell you, this is good for me to know because, you know, there are certainly like madness cults in Eberron. And, you know, it's good for mm -hmm. me to know what your lines and veils are around that, mm -hmm. you know. So maybe we'll talk after this or something just so I know yeah. if there's anything I need to avoid, if that if you're OK with that. Oh, like, like, I don't mind NPCs. We, we can talk about this later. It's just that th I can't play this. Okay, well, yeah, let's hang on to that thought then, because that's that's an important distinction. And I don't want to leave it on the table, as it were. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right, mental illness. For the purpose of this discussion, um, and you're going to hear that phrase a lot, mm -hmm. for the purpose of this discussion, mental illness is an ongoing, persistent mental problem. It can be rooted in biology, it can be caused by traumatic circumstances such as PTSD, or it can be a mix of the two. I, I think... 
again, for the purpose of this discussion, because we're mixing this with gaming and faith, yeah. the, the key distinguisher between mental illness, insanity, and madness here is this is like the serious real life stuff that people you know struggle with. Mm -hmm. This is depression. This is anxiety. This is PTSD. Schizophrenia. Bipolar disorder. Borderline. Nameable syndromes and problems. Yeah. It bears mentioning all three of us have had problems with anxiety and or depression, either our own or a loved ones, at one point or another in our lives. So this is kind of personal for all three of sure. us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I've talked I, – I know I've talked on the mics about anxiety issues before. Yeah. So let's talk about mental illness in-game. It, it is tempting to say – don't do it and leave it at that, especially when you're talking about role playing a player character. I think the more complete and more thoughtful advice is be sensitive. I yeah. don't think any of us or frankly, anybody listening to this show would would think that simply suffering from mental illness makes someone dangerous or evil. Right. Yeah. Although that is a nasty, problematic trope that shows up in media way too often, even still. And I think if somebody were role-playing a character and, like, actually putting effort into it, I don't think it would come up. I do think there are people who want an excuse to be a jerk and just say, oh, my character's crazy, right? Like, that's – that happens and they yeah. need to stop. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, well-thought-out characters, this is a trap that people tend to avoid. <sighs> Why would you want to play a character like this? Don't do it for the lulls, first off. Let's, let's just yeah. Yeah. end that right there. Don't do this for the lulls. It's not funny or quirky to have the issues that I had, which were minor by some people's standards. It, it's not funny to be self-destructive or have thoughts so irrational you can't leave the house, which are, are things that I have struggled with. Mm -hmm. Uh, that it's not funny. Don't do it for laughs. If you are going to do this, I, I think one reason that I would want to do this, and this applies to so many other aspects of gaming far outside of, of this particular topic, but to gain empathy for those who deal with this issue on a daily basis. Yeah, kind of walk a simulated mile in the shoes of a sufferer. That's a good reason. There are probably a lot of different reasons. I think there are plenty of good characters out there from different literary and other media sources that you could easily borrow from, and some of those do have some of these issues. Whatever it is, my advice here is make that reason explicit to yourself and to the rest of the table. Right? Say out loud, this is why I want to, to play a character with this particular condition. Not only is that just good to let people know at the table, it'll help you focus on how that illness factors into the story you're trying to glean from them. Right? Make it explicit to yourself. It also brings everybody else kind of into the role of helping check you if you do something insensitive or um, thoughtless with it. Mm -hmm. People can be like, hey, you know, I know it's just a game and whatnot, but that was kind of not cool. We need to back that up and find some other way for you to do that scene. Mm -hmm. Right. And you may owe us an apology. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if we're, if we're trying to be sensitive about this, what does that sensitivity look like? First... I think we can all agree. Don't make a caricature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And, and specifically, don't make that mental illness a the only defining aspect of your character. Make your character a fully formed person who has to deal with this in some way. It's important, potentially, but it is one of many things that affects their lives. Yeah, they still have all of the relationships or the feelings of isolation from not having them, normal like biological drives, standard motivations for things like, you know, personal advancement or that sort of thing. All of that stuff needs to be in there. You can't just take like one specific character trait and that's all there is to this person. Exactly. You can use it as a jumping off point. You know, it's like, okay, this person has, let's say, really severe anxiety. How does that inform them? What kind of character archetype would be the sort of thing that a person with severe anxiety would gravitate towards, you know, and, and like a cyberpunk game, are they like the Decker? So they don't ever have to actually go out into the field or are, did they have the kind of anxiety where constantly being 
out of the field and watching the rest of their team out there and not being able to help, would that make it worse? And they need to be like a street samurai or something who can at least be out there and get in the way of stuff. You know, it's think about what form it takes, how it affects the rest of their life, how they personally feel about it. Mm hmm. That'll at least give you a jumping off point. Yeah. If you are looking for a fully formed character who has severe mental illness, but is still a major agent in a story, I would recommend watching Hotel Artemis if you can. It is a very bloody action-y movie, but there's, there is a character, it has, it is one of the most accurate depictions of agoraphobia I have ever seen in my life while still having a character that has a lot of agency in the plot. So if you're looking for inspiration like that, Hotel Artemis, I honestly, I would start with Hotel Artemis. Interesting. Never even heard of it. Is it live action anime? What it, it is live action. Uh, Jodie Foster plays the character with agoraphobia. Oh, huh. OK. I vaguely remember like an ad or trailer for it now. Cool. How recent is this? Pretty recent. It came out last year and then was swallowed up by a bunch of other box office hits. And uh, OK, it also I'm, I'm just going to say it. It needed a bit of work in some ways. The concept was great, but... And the acting! Oh, the acting's amazing! I, I think they could have done better with the concept, but I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> okay, that's fair. But that does bring up an important point here. Do your research when you're starting a character like this. And yes, this is work. You signed up for this when you decided to do this, and when you accepted Christ and his command to treat others with dignity and respect, okay? Your goal is to find out what it's actually like to have the mental illness in question. And to figure out what parts of that come through in your character. Because mental illnesses often express themselves a little differently in everybody. And so think about it in terms of your character, not just whatever you read off Wikipedia. Because don't just read a Wikipedia article. I mean, start there. That's a good start. But it's the internet age. Scroll down to the bottom and look at the sources and start digging into that Use stuff. Use the citations, but like the Wikipedia article is not enough. Right. But even beyond that, find a YouTube video of somebody who suffers from something answering questions about it because they exist find an autobiography or an ama even find a blog that somebody with that condition writes about dealing with their condition they're out there find somebody who's got a twitter feed describing these problems or whatever it is and and study that stuff because i think it is important to not just read clinical material but also find expressions of actual living from people who who suffer that condition, okay? And I, it is important to consume media that those with the condition in question indicate is accurate, right? So if somebody, you know, thinks Hotel Artemis is great for studying agoraphobia or, like, getting the idea of what agoraphobia is really like... I, an agoraphobe, <laughs> recommend Hotel Artemis. Right? If you think it's great and you have that condition, it's like, oh, okay. Another recommendation while we're giving them here uh hellblade senua's sacrifice oh gosh is yeah it was specifically made to depict mental illness in a way that kind of like puts the player in the character's shoes mm -hmm. i will say i have i think it's very well done i have never been able to play that game for more than about 30 minutes at a stretch yeah it is so incredibly stressful to be in that position. There's also a, another video game, and for the life of me, I cannot remember the title of it, but I believe Jack Jacksepticeye did a playthrough of it on YouTube, and it is a simulation of an anxiety attack. Hmm. Ooh. It's... I, I was able to watch it, and I have panic disorder things as well. I was able to watch it in, like... 15 second chunks okay <laughs> and it's, it's not a long game by any means depression but... quest is a thing that's out there too mm -hmm. these are all good sources if you're trying to experientially understand this instead of just clinically understand it which is what you need to mm -hmm. role play yes. right yeah again don't neglect the clinical stuff because that's often got useful clues for your character but the experiential stuff i feel is a little more important for what we're doing yeah, I'd say the experiential stuff is great for role play. If you are going to get into the mechanics of what mental illness is going to look like mechanically for your character, mm. I think that is when the clinical explanations will come in quite handy. Yes, that's that's a good point. Now, um, one thing I don't want you to do is find somebody on social media who talks about their condition or a condition they're an expert in and demand that they explain everything to you. 
okay? (laughs) Because I've seen this a lot across a lot of different topics. Do your homework, respect their time, okay? Now, if you have specific questions that depend on and respect their specific expertise, I think it's okay to ask those. The worst you'll get is a, you know, uh, I don't have time for that, or you'll just get ignored. But, you know, if you've done your homework and are asking detailed questions about some kind of subtle, specific thing, that's a lot different from explain schizophrenia. Yeah, and if they go into like a lengthy thread where they're deliberately trying to interact with people about stuff, by all means, jump in. But watch for that sort of thing to be happening in real time. Don't chase them down after the fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't be a sea lion. Last thing on this, recognize that every case is different. We talked about this before. You know, you're going to see that people express these things in different ways. Think about how your character's version of that is unique. You know, there are mental illness adjacent things like imposter syndrome that can help player characters feel a little more human and interesting. Lambert had this in the Colony (laughs) game, no question. Because so do I. Like, yeah, yeah, I've I've got a it's not actually a mental illness by a clinical definition, but it is definitely the sort of thing that will make life difficult for you and mess up your internal life a little bit. Yeah. And it is certainly a symptom of many mental illnesses. So how do we make this appear in a character? We can mechanize this to a certain degree. I personally have zero problem with the the DM says, cool, it's a new day. You roll a d20 and the higher the result, the worse the flare up that day is. I have zero problem with that because when I have a bad flare up, it feels like the world rolled a die and critted. Like, there is no rhyme or reason to a flare-up a lot of the time. There are some times when an in-game event may trigger a character. And and you can mechanize that as well. Like, I would mechanize a particular type of anxiety attack that I have. I would mechanize that as you are essentially... Everybody has an advantage against attacking you kind of thing. There's another type of anxiety attack that I have where... Oh, no, this is a, a a thing in a lot of video games. It, it'd essentially be like the confusion thing in Pokemon, where it's like you you try to do something productive and only end up hurting yourself kind of thing. Like you just become super disoriented. Right. Um, I have zero problem with the mechanization of certain symptoms of mental illness or anything like that. Yeah, I think where a lot of people shy away from this and where it's, I think, very badly implemented is role to acquire a mental illness. Yeah. Like yeah. that. Uh, I kind of understand it in like a Call of Cthulhu where your character is not going to last very long, mm-hmm. but it's rarely done well or sensibly because often it's, you know, I mean, the worst case is I'm going to pick on Palladium here, but like it, the, uh, they have a example of this where it's like, yeah, you, uh, you experience mental stress from fighting a vampire roll dice. You're afraid of fish. What? (laughs) Yeah. Like, it it doesn't make sense. No. But, you know, if there's a a random strength of the problem that day or a random effect that is is showing up a lot, you know, that works fine. Mm -hmm. I will say, like, great as Jenny is and smart as Jenny is, there might be somebody at your table who would be very uncomfortable with what she's comfortable with. So once again check with people first know your group and if if anybody takes issue with this hands off and and back off yeah don't just know your group ask your group yeah yeah because a lot of the time this isn't the sort of thing that you're going to know unless you've been very close with your group for a very long time because we're usually doing genre fiction of some sort when we're role-playing think about how your mental illness for your character interacts with the fictive elements of the genre and setting are there cranial implants that don't work for your character because of their condition in a cyberpunk game is your character more or less susceptible to illusion magic talk to your gm and say like hey you know this is a thing here are the consequences now if you're playing a real crunchy game maybe they have some of those already use those as a starting point but build out from there very few games do it well unless they're specifically designed to handle that well And don't be afraid to say, you know, I'm taking a bunch of trade-offs. Hey, GM, can you give me one or two little things that happen to to go in in my favor? As long as the weight of it is towards the penalty side, I think it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. GMs, we we keep saying this, don't let your players do this for funsies, 
Okay. Give the disadvantages that the actual mental illness has to that player character and don't let them just kind of get away with, haha, my character has such and such. Right? Yeah. And make them play it seriously. This is a time where if, if you are not trying to play this in an engaging role playing y way, I would recommend that you just start doing that. Like if you guys are playing a primarily mechanical kind of game, I would recommend you get really heavy into the role play with this person and you make sure that they know that their character is scared or aggressive or experiencing something very, very different from what the rest of the party is experiencing. Yeah, and the the point is not to be punishing, but rather to make sure that they take it seriously. Yeah. Okay, so how do we handle this at the table? How do we handle mental health flare-ups at the table? Because we like to talk about how the things that we look at in role-playing are reflected in real life. Okay, first thing. I think we've all had people who've missed a game for mental health issues okay yeah these are every bit as valid as a physical health issue sometimes more so you can you can play through a broken arm once it's been put in a cast if you're having a really bad anxiety flare-up or like one of those i'm so depressed i can't get out of bed episodes that's crippling for gaming i've had messages from members of my gaming group before five minutes before a game that just say can't and i'm like all right you can't (laughs) Yep. That's fine. And that's fine. And you just, that's okay. Mm-hmm. They can't, they can't. Yeah. yeah. You know, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly. Micah's admonitions are eternal. <laughs> Extend grace to everybody in your gaming group, right? Uh, Jenny, do you want to talk about spoon theory? Because mental illness often does steal spoons. Yeah. So spoon theory is the idea that you you have a certain number of spoons in your drawer. And for people with no mental health issues... They they have a lot of spoons, and they can spend those spoons eating whatever metaphorical soup they like, I guess. It comes from let, – let's maybe back up a little because the origin of this, I, I actually know. It comes from somebody who was trying to describe the lack of decision-making power and, and the tremendous fatigue that they were suffering from, right, mm-hmm. uh, because of their, their particular mental health conditions. Yeah, they were at a cafe with a friend while they were talking about this. And they this. literally just grabbed up a bunch of spoons from like the, the nearby tables because it was kind of a diner thing where the silverware is just left out. And they're like, okay, you've got 12 spoons, all right? You have to spend these spoons. And they hand it to their friend. You have to spend these on everything you do. So you get up out of bed in the morning, that's a spoon. You did your hair, that's a spoon. And just spending these very limited resources on things that people who are healthy take for granted. That's because they have so many spoons that they don't notice the effort that goes into it. Decision fatigue is part of this, but also there's a real fatigue and just a real incapability in some cases. And the important thing is that you don't always have the same number of spoons every day. Grant, let her go. A lot of <laughs> a lot of people also compare this to spell slots. Hmm. Um, so on any given day, I can have all the spell slots up through level six that you can have. Other days, I'm stuck with cantrips, and that's it, and sometimes not even that. And so you have a limited number of spell slots that you can use. If I'm stuck with cantrips, I I might be able to brush my teeth for half an hour, but not leave the house. That's what I call spell slot theory. It's slightly different from spoon theory. I kind of like that because it does differentiate the little things you can do from the bigger and bigger and bigger things that you can tackle some yeah. days. I, it also describes, at least for me, how my various mental conditions get me stuck in ruts. Mm. So I have literally before just sort of absentmindedly filed my nails for an hour and a half because that's what I could do that day. They, they, they looked great. They were very smooth. I smelled I terrible and my <laughs> hair was oily as heck, but wow, my nails were great. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> just, a, just a real quick thing, because Jenny did interject some humor here. <laughs> Using humor to process stuff and laughing at it are like at opposite ends of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One one is respectful of what somebody is going through and the other is not know the difference. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. If you're 
suffering from some sort of mental illness and you're in with a group of friends at a gaming table, you know, ask them for, for grace and accept it from them because they will be willing to make allowances for you, help you out. They'll make sure that they are there to help you do what you can. Okay. And if they're not, it's time to find a new group. <laughs> or teach them. Again, lines and veils, they're important here. If you if there are things you can't handle in a game, be explicit about those up front. Or, or, you know, it doesn't have to be super explicit, but just say, you know, don't do this, don't do this. And if you're at a table with somebody suffering this, pray for them. But also listen to God when he replies to your prayers by telling you to be there for them too. Don't foist the problem off on God. Ask God for help dealing with the problem. We're in a relationship with God, and we're called to be his workers in the world. Do the work. Now, this doesn't mean trying to treat people. Leave that to the professionals God called to that field. But be there for your friends and table mates. Encourage them. Help them to get care if they're not doing so. And even if they are, it doesn't mean they don't need to lean on you occasionally, even despite the fact that they're getting help. Yeah. In fact, sometimes... I have found that when people start getting help, they realize just how much it's done and they they suddenly need a little more assistance because they're sort of, it's that moment of sagging and going, oh, 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 oh yeah, wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. So be aware of that. Outside of the gaming table, on I mean, you know, just general life, this is – it's the same advice and this is going to be true of mm -hmm. all of these, right? Be patient with people who are struggling. Don't expect – people to just snap out of it you know these things don't happen right i will say this i sometimes get frustrated with myself and with people who are suffering from it and i lose my patience and that that's me sinning <laughs> that's me not having sufficient patience it does happen apologize for it afterwards but you know it may happen and it sucks but Sometimes your desire or your attempts to be helpful or supportive throw gas on the fire. I have been particularly guilty of this with a one specific friend of ours in the past, and I don't feel great about it. So just be aware that that may be a thing that's going to happen. Yeah. And, and listen when they say that, right? Listen, listen to feedback. Yeah. Most of the time, people are going to know what kind of help they need. A lot of that time, it is going to be much more of a passive thing. It's going to be you maybe just listening and not saying a single word. And that's okay. You, you are not required to interject at all points. <laughs> this is not a thing that you, that is, the, the Lord does not require this of you. Sometimes it may be much more of an active thing. I know that there, was a time uh, in a sort of previous iteration of my mom's gaming group where this one player just was not, he just didn't show up that day. And they were like, dang, where is he? And so they all just went to his house and he was like, yeah, I just couldn't leave today. It's like, cool, we'll bring the game to you. And they just sort of had a great time at his place instead of at the regular gaming place. And sometimes it's going to be like that. There's a uh, wonderful heartwarming webcomic that's gone around with the the guy who's too depressed to leave his house and his friend goes and gets like all of his weightlifter friends from the gym and they pick the the couch up with him on it and carry it out to the park so he can see the ducks that he likes yeah <laughs> yep. it's a good one all right we've spent a lot of time talking about mental illness the good news is talking about insanity and madness should not take quite as long <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Let's talk about insanity. Again, for the purposes of this discussion, we're, this is a, a temporary acute sort of problem rather than an ongoing one. As a snap of some kind. Uncharacteristic, irrational behavior caused by something. Okay. Now, the insanity defense, I think, is, com is well known to all of us. It's used as justification for all kinds of horrible stuff in the real world. Tread lightly when you're using this. As with all of these, be careful how you use it. Insanities are often the result of some sort of trauma, as far as I can tell. Yeah, like immediate trauma. Yeah. It, yes, it doesn't have to be immediate in the sense of, like, has just happened. Yeah, but, like, recent. Yeah, stuff that's... Sometimes it's stuff that builds up and then reaches some kind of a crescendo. Yeah. The trigger for that can often be apparently small. 
but it's building off a lot of pressure, right? It's, it's like a pressure release that all of a sudden all of it comes out. The line between disordered behaviors like this and coping mechanisms, it, it seems to be a little blurry to me, but again, not qualified to explain. You know, so, so sometimes those coping mechanisms are longer term versions of this, you know, where there's somebody behaving in an odd way, uh, doing something that seems self-destructive, but it's a coping mechanism to handle or to avoid something else that's wrong. Professionals can help find out what that underlying cause is, but try to remember that when we're dealing with a be behavior that's inconvenient or distressing. In game, as we said, this, this is kind of about root causes and trauma, right? This can be an interesting story mechanic and not just as a justification for some horrible crime. Um, there's, there's a particular piece of media that I want to recommend. Uh, if you guys haven't seen the movie John Q with uh, Denzel Washington in the lead role, go watch it. It's an interesting example of this in play, and it's just a solid movie to boot. The short, non-spoilery version is that the circumstances in this guy's life build and build and build until he does something really desperate, but he doesn't become evil in the process. And it's it's kind of a neat way of showing how people can snap without going just full monster. And I, I really like it for that. I, I think it's just a good movie, too, as I said earlier. But yeah, it's it's good for that. The other thing is, one of the things common to these is the idea that stopping a normal, basically good person from causing tragedy beyond what pushed them to the breaking point makes for an interesting story. You see a lot of this in the Flashpoint TV show, which is another piece of media that I've recommended at various points in the past. They get details of like policing wrong and stuff, but the empathy and um, kind of worst day of somebody's life aspects of the job that you see from the team are really kind of cool and make for some very gameable stories steal from that if you want to to go there mm -hmm. obviously also it doesn't have to be violence or a crime if somebody who's usually like really stingy just runs off and starts doing all this impulsive spending like seemingly out of nowhere excessive fill in the behavior people can do bizarre things that make onlookers or close family go that's just not like them or that's just not right even and figuring out kind of what the root causes of this bizarre and uncharacteristic behavior especially if they're doing something that could eventually really start to cause problems that throws like a ticking clock aspect into it mm -hmm. can make for some really entertaining tense storytelling but you still got to handle it with some sensitivity absolutely at the table and in life if somebody's having acute issues at the table or otherwise call for help they need it if somebody's developed some sort of less dangerous but unhealthy habit as a coping mechanism, bring that up with people who care about them and encourage them to seek help for it. If you can, direct them to specific resources because that often acts as a, a goad and a prompt for people to take action on it rather than ignore it or just kind of cope with their loved one's odd behavior. Letting people know that there's help and that they should call can often be surprisingly productive. It also might be worth it, both for insanity and mental illness. You don't have to be mentally ill or insane to talk to a mental health professional yourself, even if it's just to get advice for somebody else. Mental health professionals are there for everybody, not just for those who are sick. Last thing, madness. And again, for the purposes of this discussion, we're talking here about some kind of mind warping effect, something external. We're going to say supernatural a lot because, ooh, spooky eldritch stuff. But, you know, it, it's all of these things that we've talked about before. Yeah, this can be like cyber rejection or some weird sci-fi drug or something like that. And this is where we get deep into the genre elements, okay? But those are fun. And these can look like severe mental illnesses or insanity. They can look like something else entirely, you know? And they may have weird, strange effects on the, the person and other people and reality itself. Who knows, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we could extend this definition to non-supernatural mind-warping effects, mind-altering substances, mob behaviors, demagoguery, whatever external thing makes somebody act in strange and unusual ways. In-game, obligatory Eldritch Horror reference. This is the domain of the GM, but don't let that stop you as the player from jumping in, because I don't know about you, but I have fun when my character does have a Shoggoth drive them mad, and then they do something bizarre and unusual, and it yeah. all fits into the, the story of a self-destructive 
Call of Cthulhu downward spiral. Yeah. Like one of the best times I've ever had at a convention game was during a, I think it was a Delta Green game. And it, it had gotten to the point where my character had lost all sanity points. And the GM was like, okay, you've lost your mind. What do you do? And it was just like totally open ended. Like, I don't think he rolled on a sheet or anything. It was just like, all right, you've lost it. What happens next? Yeah. And my favorite thing to do is like, oh, I buy in, <laughs> you know, <laughs> buy into the mythos. I'm I, I'm team mythos now. Yeah, it, it's it's great fun. You can always say the Shoggoth did it. It's OK. Blame <laughs> it on the Shoggoth. Or the Hound of Tindalos or blah, blah, sure. blah. Mythos monster here. <laughs> Blame it on the Shoggoth would be a great <laughs> Ow, T-shirt. Jenny. <laughs> Blame it on the Shoggoth. Ow, Jenny is probably the T-shirt. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. She kicked me in the kidney. Oh, that's no fun. You're a jerk. Get out. Kung Fu cat. Oh, good times. We're out. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think we might leave this one in, too. <laughs> it's too good to pass up. Anyway, something to think about. Is this specific to your character or is it affecting multiple characters in the setting? If there is an external cause, what is the purpose that that external cause is trying to pursue? Is this some alien intelligence Whose perspective, who, whose perspective just doesn't fit how our brains work? Is there some evil force manipulating people? So on and so forth. Yeah, a really interesting example of this that wasn't even sapient probably was the shimmer in Annihilation, where it just kind of warps everything. Yeah. Are you talking about the... The movie. Okay. The book? The book is different. It's also a good source for this kind of thing. It's a, it's, yeah, it's hard to do. I'm amazed they tried to turn it into a visual medium at all. They did a fairly good job of it as far as I'm concerned, at least making it like creepy and weird and bizarre. Oh yeah, the author considers it a totally different piece of media. He was ha glad to have a part in it, but he considers it totally different. Sure. LA Confidential is much the same. Anyways, moving along. Yes. <laughs> I actually feel like I did an okay job of this in the colony game at one point we had this really fun moment with a little miniature beholder named sal who came from a distant plane of madness and chaos as beholders tend to do he was it's a summoned extra planar thing i think called a spectator if i recall something yeah. like that yep a uh, little four-eyed beholder instead of eight-eyed and uh sal was very polite he was he was kind of the the major domo of this little extra dimensional space and uh, he warned the party that his name didn't fit into their brains properly. And when he gave the party his real name telepathically, it was a set of simultaneous nonverbal sensations that I described that were nonsensical and generally awful, but memorable and fun, right? It still stands out as a fun moment yeah. in the game for us after a couple of years. And it was a good way to drive home the alien nature of beholders and beholderkin. And, oh, this place is weird. Yeah, it's it's also worth noting that we did get into a fight with Sal eventually, but he wasn't like a super malicious or antagonistic character by nature. It was kind of a circumstance kind of a thing. You were trying to stop his master who had gone crazy from doing whatever weird crazy thing he was doing. And I say gone crazy because he was specifically delving into eldritch evils and had been cursed and turned into something. Yeah. And th like, this is the reality warping madness that we're talking about here that it's that kind of crazy you know it's and but he's like well look the boss says don't get it, let interruptions happen y'all are interrupting please stop and you talked him out of fighting a couple of times it was actually great i had so much fun with that moment i still remember the descriptions i gave yeah <laughs> yeah and i the the funny thing is too is it's like the fight went long enough where he realized he was not going to beat the party, and then the fight stopped, <laughs> and we all kind of worked together to get out of the plane. So it was it was an interesting little interlude. It was. Or at least didn't work at cross purposes is probably a better way of putting it. I don't know how helpful he really was, but... Gosh, I wish I'd been there for that. That sounds like fun. <laughs> that was a really great session. It was fun. If I remember correctly, it was... Uh... Let's see. Sal's name was uh, The Taste of Spoiled Salt, The Sound of a Hundred Glass Symbols Screaming Simultaneously, and The intent Intensely Erotic Sensation of Your Third Vertebra Being Crushed into Powder. 
Ooh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was his name. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I had fun with that. Now, if this sort of madness is a regular thing in your game and long-term mental damage matters, I'm hoping you can hear the quote marks on damage, use a system that tracks this in some way. If your game doesn't include it, house rule it, borrow it from another game, whatever, right? If you're just doing one-off or rare moments, though, you, you really don't need a system for this. No. There will be weird cults in the Eberron game. I'm not tracking madness. The point of the game is not... How much madness are we suffering from? What is our mental state at various points along the story? And how does that affect the story? The point is, we're D&D adventurers who also own a business, and sometimes we have to fight aberrations. Yeah. It's fine. There are games where you track this long term, and your character's going to just deal with it, right? Yeah. Call of Cthulhu and Delta Green are the two really obvious ones unknown armies too to an extent yeah unknown armies has a different tracking system and i don't think it could be applied to any other game but unknown armies has a really good system for it's it. a very cool system i do like it <laughs> like a lot of things that greg stolzi does it's both yeah. inspired and specific i think it is maybe a little more flexible but you'd have to file a lot of the serial numbers off let's just say yeah, that yeah you would <laughs> yeah if you're playing a game where there's kind of these, these madness effects applied, but the GM and players expect characters to be able to function later, provide an out. Yeah, and, and most games do this, right? A curse has some way to end it. You, there are ways to end the, the madness you're suffering from, that sort of thing. A lot of the time, it's as simple as casting the right spell. Heal gets rid of it, or remove curse gets rid of it, or some mental solace spell. Yeah, something, yeah. Uh, either way, most people probably won't find it super enjoyable to play a character that they can only partially control long term if they're the only one at the table suffering from right. that. Or worse, whose perceptions they can't trust because that's so frustrating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Short term, if you buy into it, it's fun. If it becomes a, dr- a long term penalty, it's just incredibly frustrating to deal with, which, by the way, you should think of for people who actually suffer from conditions that cause that. Yeah, imagine you can't turn it off. But as an arbitrarily applied game effect, it's really annoying. Don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, short term, it can be great. The Cursed Sword story arc that we had in your colony game where we got this evil sword and it kind of amplified all the worst parts of Lambert's character, that made for an interesting arc. You were the one who came up with every part of that. I just said, hey, the sword's cursed. And it it's kind of a, an angry curse. I was like, okay, well, I've got this flaw, and, you know, <laughs> off to the races we went. It, yeah, and he did kind of do that. It's just like, hey, your character has this temporary flaw. That's a really good way to put it. I think the reason why that worked so well is because you came to me and got buy-in from me. We, we acquired that item. Um, we played out the rest of the session normally. You were like, hey, Peter, stick around on the VoIP call for a few minutes afterwards. I want to discuss something about the treasure you got. And it's like, okay. You're like, yeah, the sword's cursed. <laughs> I think what I specifically said was, hey, this sword is cursed if you're okay with that. <laughs> Basically, is kind of what it came down yeah. to. And I think your response was, I've never dealt with a cursed sword before. Sure, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we, we dealt with it for like an arc. And it's I wasn't super subtle about it, but it's like Lambert started displaying all of this angry behavior. You know, I, I started saying that he'd get like this kind of angry glee about certain things and you know he his hand would like drift to the sword at random moments and stuff like that and the rest of the party were like oh this is not good (laughs) this is not who this guy is and this is getting worse i think one of the reasons that you weren't subtle about it is because i specifically said listen let's not make this go through the whole campaign like if you still have a cursed sword in three sessions four sessions or something like that yeah so it was like okay i need to get this out you know we need to make this story happen and i I think putting i think putting that time limit on it was a really good decision because it did two things first of all it was like okay after that time limit is over i never have to do this day again you know that's the end of the storyline whatever resolution it has whether that's you know this totally consuming Lambert and I have to make another character or he gets free of it somehow. I don't have to play this character afflicted by this thing for months or years. 
the other thing that it did is like, okay, I've got a limited amount of time to make this as cool as possible. So I'm a lean into this sucker. You know, we've talked about this on a lot of other episodes where when there's some flaw hanging over a character, it's really annoying to, especially if it's like a character back backstory thing. When do you pull that in? Because for some characters, when that flaw co- comes down and the debt comes due and the hammer is driven home and other terrible metaphors, when it's time for that to trigger, there's just nothing role playable left of that character. Or it's basically just a way for the GM to pull a screw job, and that feels really bad, too. But I'm, I'm assuming good intentions here, right? But then what happens is you have to put that off the entire campaign, whereas something like this, you say, look, it's going to end, so have your fun with it now. Yeah, uh, although I will I will throw one other thing into there. That was, that was one of the more educational moments of my role-playing career because it really – gave me the experience of having fun with something that was negative for my PC. And I I think the reason why I could do that is because I trusted the group so much and, you know, yada yada, everything that we said before. But up until that point, I'm, I'm a bit of a tactician and a bit of a power gamer. And so, like, I get a lot of my satisfaction in gaming out of the anticlimax. You know, the, the plan that goes together perfectly and nothing goes wrong. You know, that's like, Yes, it's the flawless XCOM mission feeling. But that's not always the only kind of fun or the thing that's the most fun for everybody else at the table. And this was a really good illustration of that to me. So play with some of this stuff. You might find it more enjoyable than you'd think as long as the rest of the group supports you in it. And again, if you're playing a game where it's acceptable for a character to die screaming and mad, like a Call of Cthulhu one shot, it's great fun. Do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It really is. For anybody who's wondering, my character's reaction was to run very fast, screaming. <laughs> and it's amazing with that fight or flight. Or freeze. Because freeze was the other, is another option that people always forget about. That's true. Yeah. But the, the simplicity of that reaction has unexpected consequences very often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It may or may not alert the other shog off, which it did. There's that. <laughs> what's better than one shoggoth two shoggoths yeah <laughs> especially if your you know con game needs to wrap up on time yep. um yep <laughs> you've all been eaten by the second shoggoth <laughs> yeah. at the table and in life this is the most fictional of all of these so you're probably yeah. fine at the table but be aware of safety concerns try not to overdo it to the point where it becomes aggravating or tedious you should be fine do not Actively try to summon Cthulhu to your table. It won't go well. Yeah, generally don't do that. Um, (laughs) As for non-supernatural causes, don't do drugs, kids. Also, have social connections and social interactions across a wide variety of interests and cultivate those. It's healthy for your personal growth, but also you'll be less likely to be sucked into mob think that can sometimes cause you to act in odd ways, right? Yeah. Yeah. Expanding empathy is sort of like the antidote to self-enforced insularity exactly it it will benefit you to be able to see from other people's perspective on a regular basis yeah and one thing that i will say here is our algorithm enforced social media echo chambers are really bad for this yeah (laughs) i'm trying to cut back for that exact reason but basically if you've got a if you're trying to build a solid foundation for your mental health having a broader sturdier foundation is never a bad thing Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot of stuff. I'm amazed we got it done in the amount of time we have. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I am certain we've only scratched the surface of this. Oh, That's to be expected. Again, we're not professionals in this, and we're trying to cover a very, very broad topic in a limited amount of time. Having said that, I would love to hear your stories of what you've done, right? Tweet them at us. Talk to us in Discord about how you've played out characters who have mental illnesses or, you know, advice for, for mental, uh, for anybody who's at a table with somebody who's got a particular mental illness. We, you know, all of this stuff is, is very, very helpful. We do try and socialize it when people tweet at us because, you know, we, we try and share that back out. We try and reply that sort of thing. If you want to participate in that conversation, follow us on social media. Uh, saving the game on Facebook and Twitter. We have our own Discord channel, which you can find at our website along with our past episodes. 
And that's stgcast.org. As mentioned before, we're on YouTube and we're on Google Play and iTunes and everywhere else you can get podcasts on the regular. I think that about ends it for this. Yeah. Yep. Anybody? (laughs) Sounds good. Okay. Let's wrap this up here. And from all of us here at Saving the Game, have a good one. Take it easy. Play safely. We'll see you next time. See ya. See you later, folks. This has been a production of Saving the Game. All episodes are produced and published under a Creative Commons 4.0 attribution, share-alike license. Our logo is by Ruben Smith Zimple of 3d6design.com. Our music is The Promised Place Beyond the Clouds by James Opie. You can find more of his music at nihilor.com. To hear our past episodes, to find syndication and license details, to connect with our fantastic listener community, or to contact us or support our show through Patreon, visit our website at stgcast.org or savingthegamepodcast.org. God bless, do good, and happy gaming.